Episcopal Church. So it's lovely to present to you this morning in a place that feels like home. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm from North Carolinians Against Gun Violence. We're an almost 30-year-old uh, organization that has been working in North Carolina um, to prevent gun violence, um, basically through education and advocacy. Um, there are two sides to our organization, a 501c3 that does mostly education work, producing fact sheets and reports, um, and educating people around um, talking to local leaders about uh, community violence intervention programs to get more of these programs funded statewide. Um, we also do, um, on our C4 side of the organization, we do um, uh, grassroots organizing and grassroots lobbying as well as direct lobbying around policies that are shown to be effective at preventing gun violence. Um, we work a lot on the state level um, on, these, um, on these policies. So before I start to talk about gun violence in North Carolina, I want to make the point um, that I know we all know, but just really important reminder that every single one of these deaths um, is a death that happened to a person, a traumatic and violent death that also impacted any witnesses, um, impacted family members, impacted people who worked to save the life, the life of the person who died, and rippled through the community. And I think I'm going to talk about some big numbers, but I really want to drive the point home that we're talking about real people um, and real violence in our communities here. So 2020 um, was a year unlike any we've had before um, in general, and that was also true of firearm violence in North Carolina. Um, it was the most violent year of the 21st century so far um, in the United States and here in North Carolina. Um, it, we're talking about 2020 because that's the most recent year for which data are available from CDC. Most of the data that I'll present today um, is from Centers of Disease Control and Prevention. So there were about 45, over 45,000 firearms deaths in 2020. Most were firearm suicides, which is true of an average um, year in the United States. That's true here in North Carolina. Most of our firearms deaths are firearm suicides. Um, what was very different about 2020 was a dramatic increase in firearm homicides in the US as well as here in North Carolina. So in North Carolina, almost 1,700 people died by firearms in 2020. There were almost 880 firearm suicides, um, which was a, a slight increase over the year before. But the most dramatic increase was the increase in firearm homicides. There were 744, um, according to CDC data, which was a 35% increase in one year over 2019. There were 41 unintentional or accidental um, fatal shootings, 22 legal intervention shootings, which is CDC's category for when police shoot and kill someone acting in the line of duty. This category also includes operations of war. Um, and 13 that were undetermined, um, or it's unclear if it was homicide, suicide, or another type. The other thing I really want to highlight about 2020 and something that we need to pay attention to is deaths among um, kids uh, ages 0 to 17, so under 18. There were almost twice as many kids who died in North Carolina in 2020 compared to the year before. Uh, there were 105 kids who died that year. Um, and firearm suicides, there were more than twice as many in 2020 compared to the year before. So that's something, while the overall numbers are smaller than what happens among adults, because it's children um, and because of the dramatic increase, it's something we really need to be in, paying attention to and looking at solutions for moving forward. So firearm violence in um, Wake County, if we look at 2016 to 2020, almost 380 deaths. Um, and I'm going to talk some about rates, and when we talk about rates, we mean the number of people who die per 100,000. Um, and that's the way that we look at rates in gun violence prevention. In 2020, there were 88 people who died um, by firearms. Uh, in Wake County, 33 people died by gun homicide. 96 people were shot and wounded in Raleigh. Um, and gun violence in the county disproportionately impacts impacts black residents in the county who are 10 times more likely to die by gun homicide than white residents. OK, 
Okay, so this next slide is um, data, data kindly shared with us from the State Health Department. This is a slightly older data, but, and I'm not going to go over every um, fact here on this slide, but I wanna make the point that if you look at the top row, these are the counties that you hear most often about um, where people are dying from gun violence. Um, it's also the counties that have the most people. So we definitely need to pay attention to the number of people who die from gun violence and to the places where people are dying the most. We also need to think about how gun violence impacts smaller communities. And if you look at the bottom row, these are the highest rates. So the highest number of people per 100,000 where people are dying. And this is not necessarily, these are not necessarily the counties that you would, where you would expect people to be dying at such high rates from gun violence because they're not the places that we hear about on the news. But I wanna make the point that, especially if you look at firearm suicide, you know, and this is just a three year slice from 2016 to 2018, but the counties, you know, the trends that we see year after year are pretty similar. The smallest counties are suffering in a really dramatic way from gun violence and gun violence affects small communities in a way that's different than it does in a place with a lot of people where everyone knows everyone else. Each death impacts a community in a really dramatic and really traumatic way. Um, these counties, especially in the bottom middle um, part of the slide are counties where people are very isolated, largely foothills and mountains counties where people are isolated and also have easy access to firearms. If we look at race and ethnicity, um, this was from a, re a report that we produced a few years ago. So these data are slightly older, but the trends have not changed dramatically since this time. So firearm homicide rates um, most often impact um, black and native North, Carolin North Carolinians um, more than any other racial or ethnic group. During this 11-year um, period that we looked at, the rates were pretty st static among white and um, Asian Pacific Island North Carolinians um, and declined fairly steeply among uh, Hispanic Latino uh, North Carolinians during this, during this slice of time here. But if we look at numbers by race and ethnicity, it's very clear that black North Carolinians suffer far more homicides than any other racial or ethnic group. Um, in 2018 alone, there were 328 gun homicides among black North Carolinians, which was over 2.8 times um, the number of deaths among white North Carolinians. So after you know, the shooting that occurred last weekend, I, I just felt like we, we have to talk about um, white supremacy and guns and the toxic and deadly mix um, of white supremacy and easy access to firearms that we have here in this country. Um, hate crimes have risen 23% from 2016 to 2020. Um, there were 300 in 2020, there were, sorry, 3,000 hate crimes targeting black or African-American individuals in the United States. Um, the mass shooting in Buffalo is a message to lawmakers that we need to act with a sense of urgency about the toxic mix between white supremacy, white nationalism, and firearms. So this, I'm going to start talking about solutions now. And this slide, I'm not going to go through um, each part of the slide, but I want to make the point, um, a couple of points. One is that there are different types of farm, firearm violence and different types have different solutions. The things that work to prevent firearm suicide are not exactly the same or work in the same um, magnitude as they do for firearm homicide. And the other point I wanna make is there's not one singular program or policy that will eliminate all firearm violence, right? This is a very complicated problem with a lot of complicated root causes. And so the solutions have to be um, multiple. We can't address, we can't expect one policy or program to address it. We have to look at multiple solutions and implementing the best that we can according to the evidence that we have. So the first um, type of solution I'm going to talk about is, uh, is programmatic solutions that address community violence. Um, the first type, and this, this is the type that we have um, in North Carolina, is violence intervention. Um, this includes violence interruption, which um, is a type of program that you may have heard about on the news. 
um, because it's being implemented here in North Carolina. So in this type of intervention, community and hospital programs focus directly on intervening in interpersonal or group conflict negotiation um, and ceasefires and shifting neighborhood cultural norms. And some of those neighborhood and cultural norms means shifting norms around guns. Um, conflict uh, resolution instead of the first thing when there's a conflict reaching for a firearm. Um, another type of program solution is survivor support services um, because I, as I mentioned, firearm violence really ripples through communities, addressing um, survivors and providing support is an important type of program. Programs are focused on providing social services for gun violence, including resources like housing, employment, trauma therapy, etc. Cognitive behavioral therapy programs um, focus on changing the mindset, the mental health, and ultimately the lifestyle of those most at risk for violence. So this isn't cognitive behavioral therapy alone, but programs that use CBT um, in their interventions. Ecological systems are um, systems that focus on broadly on the root causes of violence and addressing those um, root causes through their programs. So focused on changing the ecology of communities impacted by gun violence through improving the quality of life, access to resources, and overall living conditions. Oops, sorry, there we go. Um, so in North Carolina, the most common type of um, community violence intervention program that we have is street outreach. Um, and in North Carolina, it's most often based on the cure violence model, which is the violence interruption model that you may have heard about in the news. Um, in these programs, outreach violence interrupters mediate and prevent retaliatory violence to those who may be at risk to commit or become victims of gun violence. Street outreach programs include long-term support and communities impacted by gun violence, as well as immediate crisis response. So these programs, taught, they work to prevent violence by teaching conflict resolution skills and mediating conflict before a conflict occurs. They address like an immediate conflict uh, when a conflict occurs, and then they have long-term follow-up with victims, families, and perpetrators so that um, there's, there's a long-term solution to prevent retaliation. Hospital-based intervention programs are another, um, are another type of program that has a lot of evidence to support it. We have two in North Carolina that are just really launching and getting started, and we're excited to see how they change the communities um, where they're being implemented. They're founded on the idea that there's a distinct window of opportunity in the aftermath of a severe trauma to actively participate with victims of violence and help prevent retaliation. A lot of shootings result from retaliation. One person is shot and then another party feels like they need to respond. And breaking that cycle um, after there's been an event is an effective way to prevent retaliation, to prevent that kind of impulsive behavior. So they have culturally competent case managers that work with individuals in the hospital and afterwards to connect people with social services, counseling, and in some cases, even relocation. They can't go back to the same communities without risking harm to themselves or others. So um, the other th point I wanna make about culturally competent case managers is these programs work best when it's people from the community, not people from outside communities going in and trying to tell everyone what they're supposed to be doing. Outside, um, you know, outside technical assistance is important to train people in evidence-based strategies, but the people who are working on the ground need to be trusted members of the community, in large part people who um, have been involved in violence and turned their lives around. Um, they can make tremendous impact um, with people who are currently going through violence. Um, and that's how these programs really work best, is when we can train the people who are living in impacted communities to change their own communities. So the next slide is some examples of programs and how well they work. Um, you know, while we do need to talk about how serious the problem of gun violence is, um, there are solutions that we're just really starting to learn about and are just rapidly expanding in North Carolina and nationwide. Massachusetts has one of the lowest rates of gun homicide and is a leading investigator in CVI, um, such as with their safe, um, 
safe and successful youth initiative. Community-based organizations um, in approximately a dozen Massachusetts cities with high gun violence rates are providing comprehensive services to what um, the programs call proven risk young people ages 17 to 24. So the, these interventions target um, very specific neighborhoods and specific individuals who have or, at, or are at risk of committing violence and by working in such a targeted way are really able to impact people on an individual level to reduce violence. Um, it's a heavy investment. It's 10 million that they spend in Massachusetts annually. And unfortunately, you know, these programs cost money. But what they have found um, in Massachusetts is that for every dollar they spend, they um, save taxpayers $5.10 um, in, you know, averted health care and other costs. Um, gun violence is expensive. So prevention, um, while it's, in, in, while, it's um, while it can be costly, it's more costly to not do anything, right? New Jersey is another a national CVI strategy leader. Newark um, has a street outreach program that saw a 50% reduction in between 2013 and 2019. I mean, 50%, that's a huge reduction in violence in really not that many years. Um, St. Louis, Missouri, which you may have seen on the news has had a lot of violence um, in the last five and 10 years. They implemented um, a program in 2020 and 2021 that included a street outreach and a hospital-based um, intervention model, and they've experienced a 25% decline just in the first couple of years that the programs have been implemented. So we're talking about a lot of lives saved. These programs really do work. It also, St. Louis is one of the few places to decline while most other cities across the country experienced a dramatic increase in gun homicides. Question. Yes? Do you want questions during your discussion? Um, sure, I can take a question. So what was it in more detail that St. Louis did that uh, uh, <coughs> provided this 25% decline? Just our questions, if, if you could either repeat or summarize. Oh, sure. The people on Zoom can't hear people in the room. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I don't know a lot about the specifics of the program. This was from a new evaluation that I just saw. I'm so excited to, oh, sorry, the question was about what they did in St. Louis to see such a dramatic decline in such a short period. Um, I, I, can, I can send Father George more information about the programs and I'm happy to do that. I, this was a slide I added kind of at the last minute of more recent work because a lot of these programs are fairly new. Federal funding around gun violence prevention was um, really expanded in 2020. And so programs that were kind of getting off the ground are now really being implemented. So I don't have a lot of the details about the specific program, but I know that it did include street outreach and hospital base, which are two different models, but both in the um, intervening in the, in the immediate as well as the, um, the aftermath of a crisis and that they experienced a really dramatic decline in a short period. But I would be happy to send um, more information from the evaluation of this program to Father George that he can share with you. Thank you for the question. Um, California, um, Richmond and Sacramento um, have a program that has had good results as well as New Haven, which saw 70% decline in eight years. I just remarkable decrease over not that many years. If we're looking at you know, the history of gun violence and how much gun violence there has been for so many decades. Um, so in North Carolina, I'm most familiar with the, the Durham program, which is the oldest program in North Carolina, Bull City United, um, which uses the Cure Violence, Violence Interruption um, model, which works to shop, stop shootings and killings in specific Durham neighborhoods using the public health model. Um, the Cure Violence is based on a public health model that sees shootings as contagious. So if you intervene in prevention, you break off um, the contagion. So last year, 
um, because of the success in the first two neighborhoods where it was implemented, and again, this is a very localized approach. So it worked really well in, the, in two neighborhoods where it was implemented over a number of years, and last year they expanded to a number of other neighborhoods, and we're really hoping to see the same kind of decline that we've seen in, these, in those first two neighborhoods in other parts of the city. It, these programs don't stop all violence, and I'm sure you know that shooting, shootings do continue in Durham. Um, but these programs do work in the places with their, that, where they're implemented, where they're funded well, and where people are adequately trained in how to, to implement these programs. Um, the county matched, uh, or more than matched, the city's investment um, with a million dollars last year. Um, so since Bull City United has been implemented, there have been 275 mediations of conflict in which um, without the program, there was an 88% chance of recidivism, not retaliation. So d these programs do a lot of good. In Durham, the program has done a lot of good and made the communities where it has been implemented a lot safer. Charlotte um, has recently invested a lot in uh, in gun violence prevention or in community violence prevention, um, they have a street outreach and a hospital-based program that have been started in the last couple of years, um, and they've invested millions um, in these programs. Greensboro is the second oldest program in the state. Um, their their program, Gate City Coalition, also uses the violence interruption model and was started in um, 2019. Winston-Salem and New Hanover um, both experienced a lot of gun violence in um, 2020 and 2021. They've both um, invested in uh, community violence intervention and we're you know, excited to see what kind of um, improvement they see in their communities over the next few years. Um, so switching to legislation, um, our C4 organization um, does uh, advocacy work on the state level especially. So our priorities for the session um, that just, they just went into session this past week, um, we would love to see more CVI uh, funding in the state budget as well as safe storage education funding. The House passed it last year, but the Senate did not pick it up. There's a huge surge in gun buying um, in 2020 and 2021, and the biggest um, increase was among first-time gun owners who don't know very much about, um, they didn't grow up learning you know, how, to, how to clean, how to store their weapons, so we really need a program that will educate, go into communities and educate um, people on how to safely store their weapons. Um, keep North Carolina's pistol purchase permitting system in place um, and keep firearms out of houses of worship with associated schools. So pistol purchase permitting, um, the reason this is important in North Carolina is because federal law requires a background check only on firearm purchases from federally licensed firearms retailers. So in North Carolina, we have a pistol purchase permitting system that closes the quote gun show loophole, but it also gun show internet community buying loophole um, on handgun sales by requiring a permit that requires background checks on all handgun purchases, even when buying from private sellers in the community, people who are not registered with the federal system, gun shows like hobbyists who sell at gun shows and guns on the internet. So why is this important? Well, without our pistol purchase permitting system, anyone could purchase handguns from private retailers, no questions asked, no background check. Um, research shows that these systems are very important. Um, permit to purchase laws like the one we have here in North Carolina um, reduce firearm trafficking. Um, in Missouri, they repealed their permit to purchase system in 2007, and they saw a dramatic increase in the years that followed in, in both the firearm homicide rate and in the firearm suicide rate, compared to what would have been expected had they not repealed their law. Connecticut, on the other hand, added a permit to purchase system, and they, their um, adding the system was associated with a 28% decline in firearm homicide and a 33% decline in firearm suicide compared to rates expected without this law. So 
when we look at the, t the combination of all of these points that we know about data around permit to purchase systems, we have a serious problem here in North Carolina with firearm violence. We need to do everything, we use every tool that we can um, that we know is working. We can't afford to change any system that we know will lead to more violence and getting rid of the pistol purchase permitting system will lead to more violence. So this is a bill, um, both this and um, pistol purchase permitting passed the General Assembly last year, but were vetoed, and so we're working to prevent a veto override. Um, this bill, as you may know, guns are allowed in houses of worship in North Carolina. The exception is houses of worship that have a school on their grounds, and the reason is that we don't want guns on any property where any child in North Carolina is learning. So why is this dangerous, adding this, this other kind of um, house of worship? So guns can be left behind in restrooms, classrooms, gymnasium. We know that that happens, and we know that happens in states that allow schools to allow guns in schools. Um, and despite prohibiting guns during extracurricular activities, distinction may be hard for people to understand. So if there's a Wednesday night Bible study, at the same time as a volleyball game on a church campus, like asking people to keep track of when these school you know, activities are happening and when they can and can't bring their guns onto campus is a lot to ask people to keep track of. And we feel like this is just a dangerous mix of kids and guns. So the last major thing I'll talk about is safe firearm storage. Um, and when we talk about this, what we mean is storing all firearms unloaded, locked, with ammunition stored separately. Gun safes and gun cabinets are the safest option. Um, lock boxes are another option, and for people who really want to be able to access their weapons quickly, who feel like they need it for self-defense, there are um, lock boxes that use a, a thumbprint or a fingerprint um, so they, all you have to do is you know, push your th fingerprint down and it opens quickly. So there are options that, that don't take a long time to access. Um, gun locks, you know, we give gun locks out at a lot of our events and they are a good option. They're free or very cheap in communities. Um, what I tell people when I talk to them about gun locks is this is good at stopping a child, right? So I have a teenager and a tween at home. If I had a gun in my house, I would not use a gun lock to keep my, my teenager from getting access to a gun because a teenager can go on YouTube and figure out how to pick a lock, right? So, for, so these are good at stopping children or stopping someone with impulsive behavior who wants to access a gun really quickly. Um, but the best option are much more secure options and of course keeping um, ammo separate and also locked. So why, why do we ask that people store their guns safely? So this prevents people in crisis, um, substance abuse, mental health crisis, like suicidal ideation. So we're not suggesting that all people with any type of mental illness um, not have access to guns. We're saying people who are in the midst of a crisis that would, act, would cause them to act impulsively and harm themselves or someone else. We don't want them to have access to a gun at the moment they're in crisis. Also substance, substance abuse and impulsive behavior. Kids and teens and gun theft from homes, cars, or guns um, left behind in public. So when we talk about safe storage, I have some of the same stats here about what happened to kids in 2020. Um, also, one in three North Carolina parents owns a gun, and one, of, one in four of those gun owners has a gun that's unsecured in the home. So that's a lot of kids potentially around unsecured guns. The other thing I want to mention is firearm thefts. Firearm thefts are on the rise, especially from cars. There were over 1,000 stolen from cars in Charlotte in uh, 2021, and over half that, 580 some stolen, I think, in Greensboro. A lot of guns were stolen from cars specifically. And some of the guns that were stolen last year in Charlotte ended up, they turned up in local high schools. So while people think that, you know, gun theft may not happen to them, like just the simple fact of either leaving your guns at home or storing it in a lockbox in your trunk and locking your car. So many guns are stolen every year from people who just leave guns in the open and don't lock their car. It's a very simple thing to do um, and a, a way that an individual can prevent gun violence. So the last thing that I'll just quickly mention is volunteering with us. Um, there are lots of ways that our volunteers um, help us. Um, 
right now we're looking for letters to the editor about community violence intervention programs because Wake County is considering um, adding a program to their budget, which would mean a lot for Wake County. So we'd love for people who want to do advocacy on, um, on behalf of these programs. Um, social media ambassadors, helping at community events. Um, we do get out the vote work. Uh, we're a nonpartisan organization. Um, we do C3, like get out the vote work, and through our 501c4 and CGV Action Fund, we support candidates um, who align with our mission of wanting to do everything they can to prevent gun violence. And I know I'm running out of time, so I'll um, just, these are the areas where we're doing legislative as well as um, electoral advocacy. And um, making a difference specifically in Wake County, I mentioned the budget um, and getting CVI into the budget. Um, you know, events, organizing, phone banking, um, donation, you know, we're grateful for all of our donors. The uh, donations make the work possible. Um, and I'm an organizer, I love to work with volunteers, I would love to work with any of you that are interested. And um, our organizations are totally separate. Um, our, our C3 um, NCGV Education Fund and our C4 NCGV Action Fund, and they have separate social media accounts, so I hope you'll give um, our accounts a follow um, and sign up to get our um, uh, our educational and policy alerts so that you can stay up to date on what's happening um, legislatively and in Wake County. Question. Yes. How about, uh, is, Sarah, are you going to take questions? Sure. Why don't I just use this microphone to help? The reason is the people at home yes. only hear through the microphone. Oh, no, you're not doing anything wrong. <laughs> I didn't see Raleigh on your list of cities up here. Right. So Raleigh is also considering a program right now. So, so is it, they're considering. How about Cary? I don't um, have any information about Cary considering a program. I know that Wake County is considering funding a program. So um, Raleigh is the city that has the most violence um, right now, but okay. Cary could certainly consider a program. So the work begins at home. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? From what I understand, your program primarily deals with securing guns that people own from uh, controlling uh, the purchase of guns and promoting these action things. Do you have any information on what actually causes the violence? Yeah. So. Like I mentioned, the causes of violence are very complicated. Um, easy access to guns makes some of these other causes more deadly, right, than use of other weapons. We're not opposed to people owning guns, but we know that easy access and in the hands of people who act impulsively is dangerous. Um, so we put out a report a number of years ago. We put out a report in 2020, and I, I, some of the older data was from that report. And at the end of the report, I talk about some of the causes and, and solutions to gun violence. I mean, certainly root causes like um, poverty, lack of education, lack of jobs, um, lack of ability to resolve conflicts in a way other than using violence is certainly part of it and so the programs that work to address you know multiple causes of violence are really effective in treating that that's why even the programs that are doing the violence intervention work they include um, they include aspects that look at the root causes of violence job training um, you know education for kids um, access to food and those kinds of things D did that help Hi, um, my question I think is like two part. Um, the first part is, is it a, so I noticed the policies that uh, we were going over, um, wasn't necessarily on like gun restriction, like restricting the sale of guns, but strategically coming up with EPP, right? Is the long term goal to eventually restrict guns, like gun sales, is that a long term goal or are we just focused on the here and now like preventative legislation? 
Right. So um, the goals for national policymakers like may be different than what we're doing here in North Carolina. Like we're not trying to prevent sale of guns or anything like that. And we know that some people use guns for legitimate reasons in North Carolina. We're not opposed to the Second Amendment. Um, in our legislature, we're operating in a defensive um, climate. So we're, with the exception of community violence intervention funding, and they did fund two CBI programs last year, which was so exciting to see something positive. Um, from our perspective, something positive happened. Um, most of the um, policies that we work on are defensive, like keeping the, um, the, the things that we know work, like keeping those from going away. All right, I do have a follow-up question. Sure. What's our strategy in relational building with people who are pro-gun? Like, how do we make that, help, help them make the connection that we're not anti-gun, mm -hmm. but we do need programs to, you know, if we're gonna have guns in our culture and mm -hmm. society, we need to also have that responsibility. How do we make that connection between, right. between that? Yeah, that's hard, right? So, um, we work with gun owners, we have gun owners on our board, we believe it's an important voice, and we're working in North Carolina, right? Like, this is a state where a lot of people own guns. Um, we're, honestly, gun owners are a good messenger to other gun owners to say, look, we just want people to be safe, right? Like, that's what we're here to do. We're here to make sure that people are safe in their homes, they're safe in their communities. Um, that's our message. No, not everyone believes that that's what we believe, but that's, I mean, that's the truth of what we do in North Carolina. Um, there are, you know, of course, there are, um, there are people who chose our messaging, but I mean, our message is that we just want people to be safe in North Carolina. And I, so I guess gun owners are a good messenger, as well as just getting the data out there. Like, what are the facts around gun violence and what do we know works? Like, the more data that we have, and now that we're able to study gun violence um, and the federal government is funding it, funding unbiased research, like, we can look at what are the causes and what are the solutions? How do we fix this? And there's a lot of research going on around this. Like, it's a very rapidly expanding area of research now that there's funding for people to be able to figure out what works in communities. All right, that's pretty cool, thank you. Um, that just made me think of my, my stepdad. He's, um, he loves guns, but he said, you know, to me that really stuck with me. He said, you know, when I was growing up, I mean, we used guns for hunting. Mm -hmm. He says it sounds like gun owners have this mindset of vengeance. He's like, there's, so I think it's good that we're acknowledging that there is more of a vengeance mindset mm -hmm. or guns are being used as a different tool for violence, you know. Right. So anyway, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you for the question. Good question. I mean, these are really like deep issues um, that require a lot of thinking long-term about solutions and about how we talk about them. Sorry, we have probably about a minute or so left. If they want. Yeah. Hold on, hold on, hold on. You mentioned several things about legislation, which I don't uh, recall right now, but uh, is there a particular bill that you think has a chance of passage in the North Carolina legislature? Um, do you mean a positive bill or a, a dangerous, what we would consider to be a dangerous? Just some bill that will help gun violence. Um, I, I think the most promising area is funding for community violence intervention programs and funding for safe storage education, especially among new gun owners. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Yeah, thank you for, for allowing me to come. I've really enjoyed speaking with you today. Well, Sarah, thank you. I re reiterate that, uh, that thank you. It's good to have you, good to meet you, and uh, good to hear some uh, really great information. That, uh, thank you, Father. So thank you so much.